what do I do? I study algebraic topology. And what do we do in algebraic topology? We try to find um, interesting algebraic invariants of spaces. Um, such as cohomology theories, which, to keep it simple today, um, I'll just think of as functors from the opposite category of spaces to abelian groups. I won't worry about gradings or anything. OK, so what's an example of such an invariant? One example of such an invariant is complex topological k-theory. Um, so if x is a compact space, then I'll define k of x to be the free abelian group on isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles on my and then I'll question that by the relation that addition of vector bundles is addition in this group. So I'm just going to say that the class of x plus the class of y has got to be equal to the class of x direct some y. OK. And that's a uh, quantivariant function because I can pull back vector bundles, even takes values in com uh, commutative rings because I can take tensor products of vector bundles. This is the definition for compact spaces. Um, if um, I have a non-compact space, then this doesn't quite work, and I have to fix it by writing um, x as a union of compact subspaces and defining the k-theory of x to be the inverse limit of these k-theories. All right. So there's an example of a cohomology theory, and a very nice one, too. Um, is there a board behind this one? Yeah. All right. So um, I said I was going to talk about equivariant homotopy theory. Um, what's that? Well, um, Often in life, we encounter spaces with a group action, right? Um, and we might want to study those from the point of view of algebraic topology. We might want to find algebraic invariants of those. So I want to study invariants of G spaces. And here I'll take G to be a compact Lie group for now. OK. and. Um, I might want to think about cohomology theories on the category of G spaces. So how can I find equivariant cohomology theories? Well, suppose I have just an ordinary cohomology theory that Again, I think of it as a functor like this, which is homotopy invariant. Um, then I can define an equivariant version of f in a kind of stupid way. Um, so I'll define what I'll call fg bore, um, a functor on the category of g spaces, Borel equivariant f theory of x to be, well, I'm going to just produce an ordinary space out of the G space X and evaluate F on that. And that ordinary space is going to be, well, I'll take the product of X with this G space EG, I'll explain that in a moment for anyone who hasn't seen it, and take the quotient by G and just evaluate F on that space. And EG here is a contractible space. with free G action. So um, because of homotopy invariance, it doesn't matter which one of those I pick. It's unique up to equivariant homotopy. And um, for instance, if I take the Borel equivariant um, F cohomology of a point, 
well, that's just the f cohomology of eg mod g, which is the f cohomology of bg, the classifying space of g. OK, so this is a kind of crude thing to do. Um, because it fails to distinguish between spaces which um, have a less free action and spaces which have a more free action. So if I take my G space X um, and I free up the G action by taking the product with EG, then these are the same from the point of view of my Bavalak variant cohomology theory. Um, so can we do better? Well, in some cases, yes. So actually, I'll leave this for now. I'll just edit it a little. So I'm going to define the genuine equivariant K theory. I'll write the genuine GK theory, which I'll just write KG of X without the subscript that I had up there. And that's going to be ISO classes of um, G equivariant C vector bundles. So that's um, simply vector bundles with a fiberwise G action, which is compatible with the G action on the um, base space X. And I'll just use the same relation by direct sum. Um, so here I've done something different. Um, I haven't just taken my G space, produced an ordinary space out of it, and evaluated a cohomology theory on that. I've really built G into the definition of the cohomology theory. OK. And um, so note that this is strictly stronger than the Bavalak variant K theory I could define that way. Because if I wanted the um, Borel equivariant um, K theory of X, I could just take the genuine equivariant K theory of X cross EG, which is not completely obvious, but if you think about it for a moment. Um, and um, on the other hand, the genuine equivariant K theory of X and of X cross EG are quite different. So let's try to compare these two things. Um, let's try to compare their values on the point. So um, if I take the genuine GK theory of a point, what's that? Well, I claim that that's also known as the representation ring of G because an equivariant vector bundle over the point is just a representation. So I'm looking at the ring whose elements are integer linear combinations of representations of G over the complex numbers and where addition is given by direct sum of representations, multiplication is given by the tensor product. All right. So how do we compare that to the cruder thing, um, the Bavalak variant K theory? And the result of the comparison might be slightly surprising if you haven't seen it before. Well, since this is a contravariant functor, I can um, pull back along the projection from EG to the point, and that's um, in turn that's the Borel equivariant K theory of the point, which is just the K theory of BG. All right. So the content of this theorem is really going to be a computation of this in terms of this representation ring here. Well, there's an ideal in here called the augmentation ideal, which is simply the kernel of the, um, of the map from R of G to the integers that takes a representation to its dimension. So. Um, it's generated by things like v minus dim v times the trivial representation, where v is any representation. Um, 
and the statement of the Atiyah Siegel completion theorem, which was proved in the 60s, is that this map exhibits the K theory of BG as the completion of R of G at the augmentation idea. Okay, great. Uh, when did I start? Okay, so that's K theory. Um, I'm going to um, talk about a different cohomology theory, which I won't quite define for you, um, but I'll say something about it. Um, I'll write it as pi upper zero. It's called stable cohomotopy. Again, it's a homotopy invariant functor from spaces up to abelian groups. And um, it bears roughly the same relation to finite sets as K theory does to C vector spaces. So you can think of it as K theory over the field with one element, if you like. Um, you can't give exactly the same kind of definition of this. If you try to imitate the definition of K theory, um, you'd get something that only sees pi one of your space. But um, this, this is really the right picture. OK, um, so that's um, a cohomology theory you can talk about. And it also has a genuine equivariant analog going from, again, the opposite category of G spaces to abelian groups, um, which uses um, finite sets with G action instead. All right, so I told you that you can't imitate the definition of K theory, but one thing that is true is that um, I, I guess I'll use the G superscript here, because that's what I was doing for K theory. Its value on a point is the um, this ring A of G, which is called the Burnside ring, ring of G, which is defined to be something very similar to the representation ring, but with finite sets instead of vector spaces. It's the free abelian group on um, finite G sets up to isomorphism with the constraint that the sum is given by disjoint union. All right, so you can ask um, about analogs of the Atiyah-Siegel completion theorem for this um, terminology theory. And this is um, a theorem known as the Siegel conjecture, although it hasn't been a conjecture for 30 years. Um, it was proved by um, Carlson, Lin, Mahold, a whole bunch of other people working at different times. It was Carlson who finished it off. Um, but the theorem is follow as follows, and you've probably guessed already, um, pi 0 comma g of a point. Well, it admits a map to the Borel version of pi 0 g on a point, which is, by definition, non-equivariant pi upper 0 of bg. Um, and this is, again, completion at the augmentation ideal, which is defined in exactly the same way as it is for the representation ring. So this conjecture was um, originally stated in a way that didn't make the analogy of this theorem so clear. 
and I'm not very familiar with the history, but I think it must have been realized at least almost immediately that these were the same kinds of questions. But um, the strategies of proof here are completely different. First of all, this is only really meaningful for finite groups. I mean, um, if, you're, um, if you put a compact Lie group here, then um, this conjecture is really going to factor through the group of connected components. Um, so um, you're constrained in that way. The way you prove the atiyah siegel completion theorem is take your compact Lie group, embed it in a unitary group, reduce to the maximal torus of the unitary group, and then prove it for S1 using bot periodicity. Here, there's none of that um, analysis kind of stuff. You just um, reduce it to elementary abelian P subgroups of your groups and do a hard computation with the Adam spectral sequence. So um, the question I wanted to pose is, how is it that two questions can be this formally similar and have such different proofs? Can we find a conceptual proof that unifies these two theorems? And well, here's the version of the theorem over the complex numbers. Here's the version over F1. Um, by talking about algebraic K theory, we can also formulate um, versions of this conjecture that sit over FP or any commutative ring. So maybe um, whatever unified proof we find of these two theorems will extend to those cases as well. All right, thanks. <laughs>